Welcome to the forge, my wanton wildlings. I'm your creepsmith, and I hope you like my work. Published on Reddit starting in mid-2016, the Flesh Interface series presents a series of allegations of interrelated experiments, incidents, and phenomena centered around the eponymous interfaces. Though what they are, or how precisely they occur, is left unclear. Equally mysterious is its author, one Nine Mother Nine Horse Nine Eyes Nine, colloquially known as Mother Horse Eyes. What follows are the first ten entries in the series. First post. In the MK Ultra experiments, the CIA dosed unwitting subjects with LSD to see how they would react. What has not yet come to light is that MK Ultra itself was an intra-agency project. The CIA created new departments within itself and fed them steady doses of LSD and other psychoactives to see how the departments would diverge and mutate away from normal departments. Whole projects and hierarchies were created, with everybody involved being more or less unwittingly under the influence of LSD. This is how the restraint bed portals and flesh interfaces were first created, i.e. from a heavily psychomutated hierarchy. The entire thing had to be eliminated, but the technology it created had been revolutionary. Second post the Strategic Hamlet Program. In Vietnam, the U.S. government tried to pacify the country village by village using the Strategic Hamlet Program, basically creating villages where there was no or little Viet Cong influence. They tried more extreme experiments where they completely isolated villages or groups of villages allowing absolutely nobody to enter or exit for periods of up to four years. In some of the villages, people simply starved to death. In other, more self-sufficient communities, the people managed to scrape by. It was noted that in many of the villages where this technique was tried, messianic or millenarian movements sprang up. In 16 separate incidences, villages were able to independently invent flesh interfaces and non-electrical portals, and it was surmised that these villages were being collectively dosed with LSD for long periods of time, and their intellectual mutations allowed for these advances. The flesh interfaces were eventually destroyed by the North Vietnamese army, at terrible cost in lives. I'm surprised that they used nuclear subs in the Falklands, considering the battle's proximity to the undersea incident zone surrounding the so-called Artigas portal. As I understand it, the portal was opened because of experiments taking place in the CIA's Antarctic station in the early 80s, and the Falklands quickly became a center for portal research. Being underwater, the portal had an enormous incident zone, and segmented whales and undersea debris would regularly wash up on the island's shores. They found one whale that had been segmented cleanly in half by an incident zone disturbance proving a perfect cross-section of the creature. They also found hundreds of chitinous cruciform creatures, certainly non-terrestrial in origin. Anyways, if a nuclear sub had wandered into the incident zone, it could have been disastrous, but I guess they considered that an acceptable risk. Fourth post, titled Harvest Populations. The Soviets designated large portions of the Ukraine countryside as harvest populations. Basically, their food and water supplies were dosed with LSD until they'd achieved what the Soviets called integration. This meant that the local populations had independently invented flesh interfaces. The Soviet army would then quarantine the area and try to remove the interface for their own use. This was usually without success and at great cost of life. Many of the soldiers and scientists were segmented, as often happens in an incident zone, so they ended up with people missing limbs, cut in half, etc. What's interesting is that the people could live for quite some time despite such segmentation. 
this is what led the Soviets to believe that their missing body parts still existed, albeit in some unknown place. So one of the leading theories of the time was interdimensionality. Quite mistaken. Fifth post, Dubai incidents. Dubai probably has the highest rate of free-floating, non-interface incidents of any major metropolitan area in the world. In one incident, a large group of migrant workers was segmented in an underground facility. Perfect cross-sectional segmentation along the frontal plane. You could see their lungs working, food being digested, blood pumping on the inside of the heart, everything. They lived for almost five months in this condition. Absolutely fascinating to see in person. There was also a group of school children who were very slightly segmented, just ends of fingers, bits of the calves and such. Hardly fatal wounds, and yet they all died within two months. Some showed signs of intellectual mutation. There are no known flesh interfaces in Dubai, however, it is surmised that the architecture is basically based on interface geometry and carries some latent interface-like power. Mass segmentations remain one of the most mysterious aspects of the interfaces. They seem to show that the interfaces do indeed concentrate on flesh living up to their name. Sixth post, Elizabeth Bathory. We look at Elizabeth Bathory as an example of pre-LSD enlightenment, i.e. somebody seeming to attempt to build a flesh interface before the invention of LSD. How can this be explained? Uh, perhaps she ingested some ergot or other naturally occurring psychotropic chemical. Perhaps her mind was simply attuned to whatever intellectual processes need to occur to invent a flesh interface. The Book of Revelation is also considered to be a description of a flesh interface, especially the description of New Jerusalem. My problem with all of this is that it's all speculative. It's like when modern psychologists try to diagnose historical figures. I'm uncomfortable with this level of speculation. I'll always regard the first instance of an actual flesh interface to have occurred in Treblinka in 1944. The geological disturbances, partial tunnels, so-called interdimensionality, and a wealth of clearly segmented bodies leave no doubt to its existence. The Soviets have documented this as well. Seventh post, a tantalizing theory. Basically, when you look at the stories of Elizabeth Bathory's behavior, it seems like she's trying to build a flesh interface. But it's known that in order to invent one, one must be under the influence of LSD for extended periods. As LSD still hadn't been invented during her life, it's probably just a coincidence. Still, a tantalizing theory. Eighth post, define a flesh interface. Obviously, I can't define a flesh interface in terms of purpose or composition or mechanism. I can only list the various phenomena which are related to them. Chief among these is the creation of an incident zone wherein objects are spontaneously segmented, i.e., parts of the objects simply disappear, yet the objects themselves continue to behave as if the missing parts are still present. Also, you see complex tunnels created in the earth. These have been termed ant farms. In undersea interfaces, you get chitinous cruciform organisms. These sui generis organisms are thought to be the result of uh, evolutionary processes which took place in an environment other than Earth. This is, of course, speculation, but I can agree with it in this case. There have been the giant metallic cylinders, which appear and experience continuous spontaneous segmentation. These are usually at least 10 meters in diameter and can get much larger and only occur in very large interfaces, i.e. portals. Beyond this, the phenomena are too various to mention, and too different for each individual interface. Ninth post, portals. Many people think that a portal is simply a large flesh interface. This is true. A portal is a large flesh interface, but it's also more than that. A portal is, as the name implies, 
a way of sending objects between the portal site and wherever the various locations that have been found beyond the portals are located, i.e. the so-called alien sister cities. Portals are usually, but not always, accompanied by the large, fluctuating metallic cylinders. The largest above-water portal that I know of occurred in Novaya Zemlya and existed for several weeks before it was destroyed by the Russian so-called Tsar Bomba. In this case, the metallic cylinders were miles high and covered with features rarely seen on other cylinders, blinking lights, nodules, so-called antennae. They took on a very artificial appearance. They seemed to be constructed technologically rather than occurring naturally. Are the cylinders themselves artifacts being sent through the portals, or are they phenomena created by the flesh interfaces in the way a mushroom cloud is created by a nuclear explosion? This is unclear. I wish I could show you guys the pictures of the Novaya Zemlya cylinders. They were truly beautiful, rising miles into the clear arctic air like great alien towers tinged blue by the vast distances involved. Though it was certainly necessary to destroy them, and we do owe the Soviets a great debt for their tireless efforts to collapse the interface, I sometimes wish they were still there. At least then there would be something, some evidence. Tenth Post Novaya Zemlya. In response to what the CIA had accomplished in their Antarctic station in Artigas, the Soviets built a larger station in Novaya Zemlya in the Arctic. 30,000 prisoners and an exceptionally pure gas concentration created a flesh interface which went through all seven stages in less than 13 minutes and became a full-fledged portal. Within a day, the typical fluctuating metallic cylinders were visible, and within three days, they were extending miles into the sky. The Soviets quickly realized that the portal was growing out of their control. In previous instances, they had simply bombed the site from the air. But in this case, the enormous cylinders and attendant incident zone extending into the edge of space prevented this, as well as the missile strikes. There was also an exceptionally large lateral incident zone around the portal, with segmentation occurring miles out from the site. Alarmed by the zone's uncontrolled growth and the growing underground tunnels, the ant farms, the Soviets worked feverishly to construct a hydrogen bomb of unprecedented power which could be detonated from outside the incident zone and still collapse the portal. The steady rate of growth within the incident zone provided them an exact deadline, which they managed to meet with only two hours to spare. Any later and the bomb could not have been placed so as to collapse the interface. In short, the world came within two hours of being subjugated to an uncontrolled flesh interface, and perhaps the end of civilization as we know it. Before the portal was collapsed, however, the Soviets had gained first-hand knowledge of one of the so-called sister cities. In other words, someone had gone into the portal and come back. Wow. Suddenly I want to call the SCP Foundation, or Mulder and Scully. Well, we'll be back to hear more of this later. Stay scary, my wildlings. Try to stay off the acid, and make the most of your nights.